I'm going to talk today about trusted hardware and blockchains. There's similarities and differences, and why it is that when we bring the two together, we can achieve effects that I would describe as almost magical. To start off with, imagine that Alice and Bob want to perform a transaction together. Bob has a new token, we'll call it Bob's Bubble Token, that he'd like to sell to Alice for Ether, and Alice would like to buy some. Well, there's a little problem here. If Bob sends the tokens first, he has no guarantee that Alice is going to pay him the Ether. And if Bob is polite and says to Alice, please, you go first, and she sends the Ether first, well, then she has an analogous problem. She doesn't know that she's actually going to get the tokens. This is the classic problem of fair exchange that we encounter in many blockchain settings. How in an ideal world would Alice and Bob resolve this problem? Well, ideally, they would like to be able to appeal to a third party whom everyone in the world trusts to behave in an open and even-handed and honest manner. In other words, what they really want is Oprah. If they had Oprah, life would be simple. They could send their assets to Oprah, and Oprah would distribute them in a fair manner. To put it another way, what they really want here is a trusted third party. The problem, of course, is that Oprah is generally booked, right? So what are Alice and Bob going to do? This is the reason that we appeal to smart contracts. And my point here is that what smart contracts do in essence is emulate a trusted third party to accomplish fair exchange and the many other goals that we try to achieve in blockchains. They do this, however, in a particular way, namely with public state, which is to say that the behavior of the smart contract and all of the data it operates on and ingests are visible on the blockchain and therefore visible to the whole world. This is something of a drawback, because it means that smart contracts don't offer confidentiality. In addition, because they're executed on chain, they typically have poor performance. Compare this with a rather different technology, something called a trusted execution environment, a type of trusted hardware, exemplified most recently and prominently by software guard extensions, an instruction set architecture extension, a new feature available in recent model Intel CPUs. What SGX provides is an environment known as an enclave in which an application can run in a protected way. Specifically, an enclave provides two security properties. The first is integrity. It is infeasible for another process, and even the operating system itself, even the owner of the physical platform, to subvert the control flow of the program, it's to say to tamper with the execution of the program. The second property is confidentiality. It's infeasible, again, for another application, the operating system, the owner of the host, to see the state of the program, to see the code, to see the data that it's ingested. Additionally, SGX provides another feature known as remote attestation, which enables a platform to prove to a remote party that a particular application is running in the enclave. And additionally, this proof can be accompanied by a key pair bound to a particular program instance so that a remote party can communicate over a secure channel to the program and the program can digitally sign data in a way such that the remote party can verify that it came from that particular program. You can appreciate that a trusted execution environment, SGX, is actually quite a bit like a smart contract in that it provides these integrity guarantees around the execution of a program, the way that a blockchain does for smart contracts. But it's also very fast. You get near native performance by running a program in an enclave, as opposed to smart contracts, which run rather slowly. But TEEs have their own drawbacks. One of these is a lack of persistence. If the machine is power cycled, you lose state, and it's also possible to mount rollback attacks against these things. Another is a lack of availability. 
If the host goes down, you have no way of communicating with the program. A key and broad important point here is that these two technologies are both essentially trying to achieve the same goal. They're both trying to instantiate a, a digital opera, as it were. They're both trying to emulate a trusted third party. But they do this in distinct and complementary ways. Blockchains offer high availability and persistence, of course. This is their basic value proposition. But they don't offer confidentiality, as I mentioned, and they have poor performance. In contrast, SGX doesn't offer availability and doesn't offer persistence, but it does offer confidentiality and it offers high performance. You can see that these two things fit well together. And it's when you combine them that the magic ensues. And I'm going to exemplify this magic by describing four different applications we've implemented. Time permitting, I'm going to give you four different examples of how this combination can be so powerful. I'll start with oracles. I would argue that nearly all interesting smart contracts need access to data about the real world. We're talking about a financial smart contract. It needs to know stock prices, commodity prices, cryptocurrency prices. We're talking about farm insurance. Then the smart contract needs weather data. If it's a betting smart contract, it needs sporting results, and so on and so forth. Right? The problem is that smart contracts don't have internet connections. It's essentially infeasible to build internet connections into the underlying consensus protocol. So we have a problem, what I'll call the data gap problem here. There are smart contracts looking for data about the real world. And there are websites that many people would trust that have exactly that data. But there's no connection between the two. How do we solve this problem? Typically, the problem is solved by slotting in what's called an oracle. This is essentially a relay between the two systems, between the smart contract and the target website. The problem is that many oracles, perhaps most oracles, don't provide strong security assurances. They don't give you ample reason to trust the oracle provider. You rely essentially on the oracle provider to ensure that data hasn't been tampered with, for instance, en route between the target website and the smart contract. In a system called Town Crier, we've implemented an application for an oracle that runs inside a trusted execution environment. The consequence is that you no longer have to trust the operator. You don't need to trust the operator. You only need to trust the hardware. Now, there's another complication here. Let's take a flight insurance smart contract as an example. Suppose that Alice wants to buy some insurance from such a smart contract. What she would need to do, of course, is present the details of her flight to the smart contract so it can check whether her flight was delayed or canceled and therefore determine whether or not she should be indemnified. But remember, I said smart contracts operate with public state. Everything they do, all the data they receive, is visible on the blockchain. That means that Alice, in buying flight insurance, has just revealed her travel plans to the whole world. Well, this is obviously a serious privacy problem. What can we do about this? Happily, we can leverage the confidentiality properties of trusted execution environments. And in particular, Alice, rather than sending her flight details explicitly to the smart contract, can send them through the smart contract into the enclave through an encrypted channel. And she can encrypt her flight details under the public key of Town Crier. Town Crier then can decrypt her flight information, determine whether her flight was delayed or canceled, and simply indicate to the smart contract whether or not Alice should be paid. And Therefore, Alice is no longer revealing the details of her travel to the whole world as before. We've implemented Town Crier as a public service on the Ethereum mainnet. You can use it today. It's been running for about nine months. 
it was, in fact, the first public-facing application anywhere, according to colleagues at Intel, to use SGX. If you're interested in using it, we would encourage you to. Please visit the Town Crier website. Example two, paralysis proofs. This project got started when a rich friend of one of my students approached him with a problem. I don't actually know the name of this friend, so I'll just refer to him as Richie. But Richie and a couple of friends owned a lot of Bitcoin. They had this large Bitcoin fund. And they wanted to control it jointly. But as I said, they had a problem. They ran into a conundrum. They didn't want to share it using a three out of three multisig. Why? Well, if one of them gets hit by a bus, then they lose the money. So that's no good. But additionally, they didn't want to use a two out of three multisig. Why? Well, they were concerned that two of them might try to steal the money. They were friends, but apparently not such good friends. So what were they to do? We devised a solution for them known as paralysis proofs that in some sense accomplishes the best of both worlds, of both three out of three multisig and two out of three multisig. The best way to explain what it does is simply to explain how it works. So I'll do that now. So let's imagine that there are three players who want to control some Bitcoin, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. What they'll do is control it through a three out of three multisig address. But additionally, they will escrow their keys, which is to say send their keys, to an application running within a trusted execution environment. Send their keys to this application. That's the setup. Now, let's suppose that Alice and Charlie think that Bob has gone missing. In this case, what they do is they publish on the blockchain a challenge to Bob. They say, Bob, we're concerned that you may have gone missing. Prove to us that you're alive. Right. Now, if Bob is indeed alive and kicking, what he'll do is just publish on the blockchain a refutation of this challenge. He'll just give what you might call life signal, wave and say, I'm still around. And nothing changes. You've still got a three out of three multisig. Where things get interesting is if Bob really has disappeared. In this case, what you'll see on the blockchain is just dead silence. There will be no response from Bob. In this case, Alice and Charlie can take a transcript of this part of the blockchain. They can take a recording of this part of the blockchain and send it to the application running in the trusted execution environment. This constitutes a proof that Bob is not around. If he were around, he would have responded, and his response would be on the blockchain. So now the application in the trusted execution environment knows that Bob is gone and can release Bob's key to Alice and Charlie. What's the effect here? Well, now we've essentially downgraded to a two out of three multisig in a conditional way. Now Alice and Charlie, because Bob is gone, can recover the Bitcoin. Why is it that we need to use a blockchain for this? Why not just use a trusted execution environment? Well, if we just used a trusted execution environment, Alice and Charlie might try to cheat. They might try to pretend that Bob is dead when, in fact, he's around. In particular, you know, if Alice controls the trusted execution environment, she could do something like drop Bob's response. When he tries to wave his hand and say he's alive, she suppresses this communication from him. But as I said, the challenge and response are actually on the blockchain. And consequently, there's no way to suppress or censor Bob's response. And this makes Richie and his friends happy. We came up with a satisfying solution to their problem. Example three, exchanges. There are basically two types of exchanges in the world. The first is what we commonly refer to as a centralized exchange. Centralized exchanges have some distinct advantages over alternatives. The first is that they can execute transactions very, very fast because they're centralized. 
And additionally, they can perform automated matching. But they have some drawbacks. The first is that the exchange operator can front run its customers. By that, I make, mean take advantage of its privileged view of customer activity to cheat its customers, to get transactions ahead of line. But worse still, the exchange can steal money from its users. Or a hacker that's compromised the exchange can make off with the user's money. This has happened in real life, and it, of course, it's very bad indeed. This problem has motivated the creation of an alternative type of exchange known as a decentralized exchange. Decentralized exchanges solve this last problem. A decentralized exchange can't make off with your money. But decentralized exchanges have their own significant drawbacks. The first is that because they clear transactions on chain, they tend to be rather slow, much slower than centralized exchanges. Additionally, in many cases, they involve manual matching by the users in the system. This can be clumsy and has various other drawbacks. And they don't solve the front-running problem in most architectures. In EtherDelta, for instance, the operator can front-run users. And in fact, even other users can front-run the customers of the exchange, as we've shown in the case of EtherDelta in particular. Imagine, though, what would happen if we took a centralized exchange and ran it in a trusted execution environment. In this case, we could get the best of both worlds. We'd get the fast execution and automated matching that typify centralized exchanges. But additionally, we could solve the problems with centralized exchanges. The exchange could no longer front run you and couldn't steal your money. Why? Well, because of the two fundamental properties of trusted execution environments. The integrity and confidentiality guarantees ensure that the operator can't tamper with and can't see transactions and can't see the private keys of users in order to steal funds. We've realized such an exchange, to say a TEE-backed exchange, in a system called Tesseract, which we're now in the process of commercializing. Fourth and last example, smart contract execution in a confidential manner. We've built a system called Ekaden, whose key idea is to execute smart contracts themselves in a trusted execution environment. This is the most sweeping of the examples that I will give. The benefits are several. The first is a low execution cost. You only need to execute the smart contract once because you know it will be executed with integrity within the TEE, within the enclave. You also get a high degree of scalability. Enclaves, as I mentioned before, get near native performance. So you can run smart contracts quite quickly. You can also parallelize their execution. And of course, you get confidentiality, this property we've been leveraging in TEEs in all of the examples that I've given. But what about persistence and availability? I said that SGX TEEs don't give you this. To get these two properties, what you can do is checkpoint the state of smart contracts on a blockchain. So again, this harmonization of technologies gives you something very beneficial. We've implemented a bunch of example applications. I won't go into them. Perhaps the most interesting is CryptoKitties without vulnerability to gray box reverse engineering. Uh, we've also implemented ML models and so on and so forth. And we'll be releasing a paper imminently. Let me wrap up here by saying that all of this work has taken place under the aegis of the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Contracts, a, an academic research initiative, the largest in the world, involving 16 faculty across eight campuses, doing a whole range of interesting projects. I'd encourage you to learn more by visiting our website at initc3.org. Thanks very much. Next up is Evan Schwartz, founder of Interledger Protocol.